You good? Tonight is short rest. We don't really need to introduce it because it's little more than, uh, think of it like a campfire where we talk about our endeavors for the week here at Penny for a Tale. Today's guest, you might have seen him on other shows. It's Mr. Smith. But before we introduce him, Daniel, how are you today? Uh, I'm doing, I'm doing all right. Uh, you know, just kind of. Kind of hang, gonna, <laughs> hanging out. You know, I'm going to grill you about uh, the conclusion of Scion, right? I have many <laughs> questions. I have many questions. Yeah, like, well, now that's over, we can we can get into it. But uh, let's introduce our guest. Mr. Smith. We summon him. <laughs> Just picture the most dramatic music right now. I encourage everybody watching. Oh. Gentlemen, that's painfully smooth. That it, I I have no follow up to that. I'm I'm crippled by by the suaveness of it. How are you tonight? I'm not doing too bad. How about two of you? Doing good. Pretty Can't complain. Okay, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, some talk of of Scion. <laughs> yeah. So if we were to graph the intensity and the scale of the campaign over time it would look like a it would look like a funky graph um, because there was this there was a steady gain where you sort of feel the the it's like quantum physics yeah or just an just a nuclear explosion where you're just right. like it's, right. so it's coming up that's yeah there's this growth and then in the last 15 minutes 30 minutes of the last episode of 11 episodes it Great call blew out. up it was like reality altering of the highest scale possible you could tell like it was time to wrap like the the way it was described was like there's no way there's a session 12 but i would do anything for a session 12 right now because wow like uh if you've seen the movie um cabin in the woods where it's like wow this oh, is freaky oh. wow this is crazy yeah. Wow, they, and the whole world is destroyed. What? Who, did, who signed off on that one? It, oh, God, it was so good. It it's was almost, so it's good. almost as if the creator of that universe just saw, just saw a dumpster fire and was like, let me kick this over there. It, oh, God, <laughs> so good. So good. Uh, <laughs> to, be, to be fair, um, the party are literally the ones who brought about the apocalypse. <laughs> as, as I recall, that... They were a bit of a hot mess. <laughs> I, I gave I gave you guys was, every chance. Was Irish to... dude that just went off the rails. Straight <laughs> yeah, up. fully. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know who wrote that guy, but it, it wasn't know. really a cohesive. Who? Yeah, he was very forced. <laughs> yeah, it was like someone someone in the production just really wanted it to happen, and and they sort of stepped on people's toes. Too. I mean, talk but about you know the shark. We'll never know who did it because the show's gone. Straight up Fonzie, so, that one. Yep. No. Hey. <laughs> so, um, Daniel, how early on did you know that you were going to just um, eat that universe it, out the window? So, in the politest way, you flipped the table that the game was on. It was what you did, but like in a respectful way that empowered the players. But you still were like, here's the setting. You changed everything. How how early on were you expecting to throw that big of a curveball? Uh, it was probably right around session. It was session like four or five. Um, really? Yeah. We had uh, pretty much went off the rails so far from where uh, Scion was originally like planned. Like at the end, the, la the last two sessions, we weren't even playing Scion. Like we, I was made. I made up my own rules fully. Uh, we were, we used the base scion sheet and we just kind of rolled with it. Like if you really, if you go back and watch the episodes, you're like, you, you guys never used any, any boons, knacks or anything from the right. actual scion book anymore. I, I gave you yeah. abilities and you rolled with it. You, it was just two and a half hours of people role playing in a world that I had thrown together. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it, 
they're just really guidelines. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, yeah, but right around session five was when I was like, I, um, we had so many players change and the uh, people were fit, like losing interest and everything, and I like I had we had just lost a third player, I believe. And we picked you and uh, Ashley up. And um, then I was like, all right, I'm going to make it a good, a, a really good um, game for like till the end. But I can't, I couldn't keep going. I mean, I could technically, I could do like right. a whole shadowed war thing, uh, but there, there'll be no build up to the, to the end of that, that season. So yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. And there's something to be said said about fully finishing strong, even if it feels like there's so much that could still be done. Yeah, yeah. I think there's merit. And then you just got to end a story while you still have control over it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I had the pleasure of playing in a couple of sessions. And uh, honestly, I was really impressed with your descriptions and the vision you put out for your world of Sion. Uh Honestly, Daniel, I really thought it was good. Uh, I enjoyed my character. I'm not so sure about that Irish bloke again, but he was all right, I guess. He, yeah, I could, yeah. I loved Ash as a character so much. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. And, so good. Um, I really wish I could have, like, you you could have played more in, in the game because I feel like um, you would have brought another aspect of like godhood to the game as to where at the end you had Astrid who were, was fighting for her father, which was for the gods. And then unfortunately we didn't get to have Jacob in the last game. So we didn't get to really touch on his story, um, how it ended. But then you had Vaya and, uh, Liam, who completely was like signed up for the villain list, like off the bat, they, right on the dotted line, in blood, infant blood, and <laughs> then they just killed everybody, everybody, everybody. But I was I was super happy how it ended. Um, There's a few things I would change, but like the whole last session, I was just waiting for that the the moment to deliver the epilogue and just kind of and that's so good because it you spent over a month telling the party at the beginning of every session the choices that you make have consequences and i always interpret it as if i do something dumb and i die that's the consequence i didn't realize like it would be it would be like like reality altering <laughs> or something on that high of a scale it was also the first time i've ever ended a concurrent game as a player the really? first time legitimately the first time yeah just because i'm the like the forever d the dm at heart well uh, forever uh, dm and not sad about it i'll mark that in my book of achievements <laughs> just yeah we, and it was almost like it, okay. it, it was it was almost humorous how well it played for me because i only participated in like eight sessions and i ended it on a throne on top of the universe or something like I basically was running things. I was the villain Antarctica at the top is where of your, your everything was. bad. Yeah, I just ran it, and I thought I was just gonna die, but I was like, nope. Every god wants me dead. <laughs> well, I don't so deserve this. My thing was like it was like session, it's like session eight or nine when you made the deal with the your boss, your old boss, the shadowed creature. And right. the shadow creature was like it was supposed to be portrayed as like a shadowed fae, like true fae kind of thing that fed off of dreams and uh, nightmares. Yeah. And then um, it just it was slowly revealed that the, like if you it, like I kept trying to push the seals like so you guys would learn more lore about everything. And if you would have, like, you probably would have put two and two together right off the bat that your boss is an avatar of the uh, shadow of creation. And that's what right. you made a deal with. And you ushered in the shadow of creation to the world. <laughs> yeah. Good I job, man. Stuff. 
there was definitely consequences. It was great. I was like, I, I didn't it. know there was way to be on point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love that direction. I feel like so many good things happen all because a player goes to the GM and says, hey, I kind of want something like this to happen at some point. No rush. That's what I want. And it's very anticlimactic because you wouldn't do it for any other medium. Like you wouldn't, like if you were making a show, you wouldn't be like reading fan letters like, oh, how should the next thing happen? Because it's like you, you make it. It's your thing to make. I, I, I got to say that there are some shows out there that I think have actually done that just to the point of no, but continue. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, yeah. I mean, I've definitely seen shows. There are some shows that had like voting. Yeah, I've definitely like like the niche thing. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not very crowdsourced. And it's mm -hmm. more like somebody has a vision in the beginning of how it should end. But every good thing I've ever done as a GM is because someone's like whispering in my ear like, this would be really cool, by the way. I'm like. I can't tell you whether or not that's going to happen, but I have heard you. <laughs> I'm listening. I, I can't feed into it because you can't know whether or not it's going to be a thing, but you've I mean, been that's heard. That's really what makes uh, role-playing like quintessential acting practice because it's always just yes and. Yes <sighs> and. Yeah. Exactly. So my like one of my biggest gripes with um, like – role playing in some games or just playing in some games is the when the when the GM or DM is like, no, I don't I don't like that. Like they they don't they take your they don't take your suggestions or how the, the vision you have for your character at all. And they're like, oh well I don't want to talk about it because it's meta. I'm like, okay, well I'm going to work towards this goal as like in in the character. And then they still don't like the idea. So they just kind of ignore everything you do and go the way they i'm like all right well this is stupid now i'm not having fun there is a there's sort of a flip side to that too where uh, a player won't isn't willing to go beyond the this sort of written in stone aspect of the vision they had for their character and so they're unable to adapt to the world that's around them um and it always ends up being well that's what my character would do well that's what my character would do and it sort of um, destroys this idea of collaborative play, shared story, because they're so adamant about not deviating from their own vision. Um, and yeah. there's definitely a, a space in the middle between the DM creating this world and creating the story, but incorporating the, the, the player's individual stories into that and then vice versa, there's this point where the players need to sort of adapt their original vision to kind of fit um, the world that they've been given. Um, it, it can be a hard balance, but though, when you find groups like that, that can sort of feed off each other like that, you get really, really amazing story. It's just a lot of fun. Yeah. Those are really good times. Oh, I, I agree 100%. Like, um, and I feel like I had a, a character or two like that in, in the beginning of Scion, one of the ones that had like dropped out that just refused to interact with the rest of the party as the party is literally like, hey, we'll protect you. Come on. And like I'm messaging them outside and I'm like, hey, 100% uh, transparency. There's no monsters in the next room. Like you're not going to die. Just please mm -hmm. go with the party because I can't, I can't like, I'm running out of ideas to keep you guys together. And he's like, well, my character went in. I'm like, all right, well, sit in the room and do nothing. I'm yeah, sorry. there's, it's like, uh, it's sort of like trying to push magnets together that are trying to like <laughs> push them apart. And sometimes you have to just completely throw in the most bizarre improv to get people just in the same room physically. They have to just be in the same space. Like uh, the last episode of Age of Ashes with Balgora. I didn't plan that at all. That's a cool power to have to teleport to your 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 thrown weapon instead of re returning to you. Like you have the returning enchantment to it. I, I just didn't. I needed to facilitate getting the party back together because it was like getting late. I was like, I don't know what to do. So I'm throwing a magic item your way just to get it to happen. It, uh, you know, I. I, I, I mean, sometimes that. that can. Sometimes that that separation of party though that can lead to some interesting story. If 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 somebody's just completely unwilling to follow and you're like, all right, buddy, let's do this. 
This was your choice. Your choice. <laughs> that's true. And a half, like a 50 50 split on the party. That's a lot of fun. Like, oh, great yeah. times. Yeah. Great when, times with it. When we ran um, the 50 50 split with Mr. Smith and Liam, when yeah. you're going through the labyrinth, and then uh, Ashley, oh, we're not Ashley, Crystal <laughs> and um, Chris were running through the, the manor. Like, that was. That was fun. Like just flashing. That labyrinth was, that was pretty badass, man. That was a lot of, I had a lot of fun in that session. Mm. I still appreciate the banter between (laughs) Ash and Liam. Yeah, the the banter is what made that that episode, in my opinion. That was the the buddy cop episode. Yeah, that was good Uh, stuff. So I have a question, Mr. Smith. Are all of your characters so cool? Oh, no. um, I, so all that I've seen, they're just uh, right. They're cool. They're just, Rooms. I just oh, this, up, is, like, this is uh, cool. this is years of uh, complete character theft from old friends. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> like <laughs> no, no, uh, no. I uh, I have no answer for that. Actually, I got I got nothing. I um, I I've been doing this for a long time, and. I have played a lot of characters. I've seen a lot of characters played. I definitely have a character type that I, I inadvertently default into. And I'm I'm trying, like, I don't know what's going to happen in the Age of Ashes. So I have I have two, two backups that I have made. And I have tried to create two completely different personalities that will force me not to sort of go into this default... I don't know, like like you're it's like you're typecasting yourself. Thing? Yeah, like I feel yeah, like I am. But, I, but I also get like I get like Nick Valentine vibes from your characters that they're just uh, I don't know they're, they're suave, um, and very observant. <laughs> That's oh, what well, I get from your characters. Like, I don't get that like I charge in and I ignore you and I'm gonna be loud, um, and I'm gonna try to kill the good guy because my character doesn't know he's the good guy. <laughs> like just like you know that player who wants to be like like anti-meta like my character doesn't know that they're doing a bad thing right now so they're gonna ruin everything it's like i so, love that it, it is some side effects of uh at least i think it's side effects of what happens when you when you role play as a hobby for such a long time you learn tricks of the trade and it goes along that old old line that no story is original anymore and so you'll find that people DMs and players have very common patterns. And after a while, you can kind of pick up on what those patterns mean. And uh, it's just, a, it, reading people has always been a bit of a, a thing I do anyway. Um, and so in a, in a tabletop RPG, um, reading the room makes uh, figuring out the story um, a bit easier sometimes, which is actually what makes uh, the Age of Ashes game, actually gaming in this new world we live in, um, so weird for me uh, because I'm not in the room with the, with everyone. So I can't, I can't get the same vibe or feel off of everyone making interactions a bit unique for me. Um, it's been yeah. a, it, it's been an interesting ride. It's very different. It's very different trying to role play um basically from the chin up yeah yeah we're just like i can't i can't even make sound effects because my microphone won't pick it up <laughs> like sorry i'm not getting anything okay yeah, yeah. all words all this is you can, an audio you can book. hammer that thing all you want <laughs> no it's nothing yeah some something play a chaotic well. character i have i f- i don't know if i can fundamentally play a chaotic character mm. I should. I really should try at some point, hmm. and just just yeet myself into everything. So, <laughs> I I have a backup character concept that I have uh, I've sent in, um, just in case Salix dies because he seems to always be like right on the cusp of death when we come to the end of a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. Just in case he dies, like, but it's a it's a full on homebrew class, and I sent it all to Ian, and I was like, "Can we make this work?" And he, he pretty much was like, 
Uh, we'll see. <laughs> but I mean, I, I have that fear that I like I'll always default to like Salix's personality because, mm -hmm. um, I like it's the 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 soldier mentality is like very like easy for me to navigate through as to where if I have to like make up a new personality, it's it I, I feel like I wouldn't be able to do a new character justice at this point. So I might have to sit out the rest of the campaign. Nah. I mean, but, but yeah, that's like I mean think about it though. That is the that is almost the best part about role playing games is just throw the shit you know out the window and jump into something completely different. And and if you if you fuck up, if you fail, what does it matter? I mean, yeah. A, you're surrounded by friends, right? Who are just going to give you shit either way. <laughs> uh, and B, you at least you, you you had a chance to try something in it and at least attempt to understand some other perspective. Oh no, it's just that yeah, yeah, I find that shit amazing. That's awesome. It's a great time. It yeah. is. No. I just have to there's like a weird dynamic of making sure it, it's so messed up. But have you ever noticed that like in, sometimes in parties, it hasn't really been a thing in this party, there are groups where a couple of the players play one character and they never die. And then a couple of the players play characters that um, keep dying and new characters come in. So that way there's like, and then there inevitably there's like a legacy of the party that's being remembered by the people who are there from level one, not the players, but the PCs that were there from level one who are sort of carrying the torch of like, this is why we're doing it. This is who we're trying to stop. And then the rest of people are like, I want to help you until I die. And then like a fortnight later, they're dead. <laughs> it's like, all right, need more help. I need uh, precisely two people to help us on this journey. <laughs> As for as know. for the uh, the custom character concept, I mean, uh, I was able to throw a non-existent uh, class together in about a week. Thank you, the only sheet, yep. by the way. So so good. Yeah, the gunslinger. That's not a thing in second edition. Really? Nope. Yeah, not a just, thing at all. Inspired from first edition, uh, from a from a monster in first edition called the Pale yeah. Stranger, which is a a skeleton with, I don't know if it was one or two guns, but it two. Um, it was two. Yeah, it was. A, it was just a. It was an undead with two guns that would hunt you down and kill you. And it was like, what if we just made that a character? What if that was a class? Just uh, and, and honestly, highly satisfying as a class. I think. Oh yeah, extremely, it was a lot of fun. Extremely entertaining. Also, the way you portrayed him was just gold. Yeah, gold. No, I, no, I, <laughs> just I amazing. Love that. Oh, I well, thank you, boys. It was a pleasure. <laughs> My like, and that's another thing. When you create a character, like you have to like bring new accents and like life to him that way. Like I can change dialect, like to a, an extent, but I can't really throw on a new accent uh, because I've tried, and <laughs> it's no good. I got yeah, like, but, I mean, three you don't words. You can't. You, you certainly can't uh, judge your how you want to try something new by how I do it or Ian does it or shit. How how like the big famous our peers do it, right? A, that's not fair to you by any stretch of the imagination, um, and certainly not fair to them because they've been you know in some cases they've been doing it for decades, right? Um, the, again, it just goes back to that whole point of if there's if there's something you're scared of trying out, if there's something that you you want to explore like what would what would it be like if if I was a dwarf or if I had some weird you know side effect or some something like that and just use your voice that doesn't matter eventually you'll you'll find a way it's like um uh Corvus the voice for Corvus I think I've told this story before the voice for Corvus <laughs> came from a second edition AD and D Advanced Dungeons and Dragons game. The history of that character was it, the, the prior to prior to game start, prior to the character coming game, he was a, a teenage apprentice wizard who was desperately trying to become more powerful. He learned about uh, this thing called wild magic and he started studying it and he cast the spell. There was a wild surge and he turned into a 70 year old man. And if you've ever played Final Fantasy, and know the character Strago, 
That was the entire depiction of this character. And the voice of Corvus was that voice. He was right. just this, he was wow. effectively a 20 year old kid pretending to be the senile 74 year old wizard. Oh, me. <laughs> I relate so hard. That is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that at all, or I forgot. Now, what was really funny is the, the voice when not in Strago and the personality when not uh, playing the character is a very like dirty old man kind of thing. Because one day at a party that I was having, the song, the Michael Jackson song "Beat It" came on. Now, if you can imagine the innuendos that occur in a song called "Beat It," yep. Imagine that voice singing that song, full of innuendo. Corvus. <laughs> okay. So, and here's the funny thing about Corvus is now I can't, I can't picture Corvus anymore the raven i picture him in the human-esque form the humanoid oh, yeah. form the little, little strago form fully can't ever unsee it and yeah. every time i hear of corvus i just picture that instead of the raven and it is so funny to me <laughs> hello old friends yes <laughs> ah. oh your ability to switch between i can't do it so like with daniel i was like hey you got to be valgora can you do that for me because i can't I so, can't take it here and then bring it in that like low growl. No, I like switching is the, like full, full transparency. That is literally just Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget when I was a child. I thought that sounded familiar. Like, that legitimately like that voice used to scare the hell out of me. Sorry. Like that's the one that I can do on spot yeah. all the time. Jeez. And a pause. Good old Honey Paws. Honey Paws, by the way, was this crazy bastard in a Mitch game. Honey Paws. Those thing, those games, those games. They're technically he doesn't, he doesn't do it much anymore, but he used to run uh, a D and D game for a while, and I am fairly certain we were just in Wonderland the entire game. That shit what? was everywhere. It was fun. Like, I had a blast, but that shit was cray-cray. <laughs> Mitchell. I don't have a follow-up. Just Mitchell. Yeah. Just yeah. fully just <laughs> Mitchell. So, uh, he, when we were still allowed to see people in, like, in person, uh, he was running... <laughs> the before a, times? Right, the before times. He yeah. was running a... Uh, invisible sun game and oh, oh my god love the invisible sun craziness like i was so into it i bought the whole black cube kit with all of the expansions and everything and oh did like, you really yeah i oh you I got a cool binder for all the cards and i alphabetized them and like <laughs> i went like full-on obsessive about it and uh i miss it like because the the world that we were in and we played in, oh, it was crazy. I'm about to uh, I'm about to start a supers game, IRL, uh, on the on the Fridays that that everyone kind of comes over and plays. Ooh. Yeah, it's based off of um, oh crap, what is that systems? Um, powered by the Apocalypse. Fair, a fairly narrative wow. system. Yeah, it's a fairly narrative system. Um, just a few dice, if I recall correctly, I'm still kind of learning the rules. Um, but yeah, I've, want, I've been wanting to do a, a superheroes game for a while, so we'll see how that goes. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, my Fridays are free now. <laughs> would, uh, so. would you like to come over? <laughs> yes. We need to do more <laughs> crossover characters on different campaigns. I've got a I've got a wheelbarrow full of them, and I just you know if anybody needs them, I make them and I don't use them. I've just got like all these cool NPCs. Like, just come by, pick them up. <laughs> I, I mean, you're, you're more than welcome to come come by anytime you like. Give me a test. We event. got a nice fire pit now. Ooh. And we kind of relax, have right. a few drinks. Like, oh. <sighs> You gonna catch me sleeping by a fire <laughs> with a drink, man? Just 
Nah, I, I feel you. Daniel, feel you. you need to roll. It's your turn. <laughs> That's so. So, um, uh, so how I got I got to ask how did Salix feel about the whole shadow brother scenario? Because I, I definitely got the vibe that um, you were unaware of this thing happening. That's the vibe I got. I don't know how true that is. <laughs> so you want to. You went, I've stopped talking to Ian about things because <laughs> I used to find pictures and stuff and Zestrix came about from a picture I sent Ian and I was like, it was a picture of um, Azazel, uh, like somebody had done an angelarium kind of portrait and um, I was like, I'm really getting dark Salix vibes from this picture and he was like, okay, next and thing that's you know. That's all you like, had to say. Five dark, I was like, Episodes later, Dark I'm like, Salix. Dark Salix, Dark what's, Salix, was like, what's going Dark Salix, Dark Salix, and fully. So you you kind of knew about it. So so here was the part. Here was here was the craziest part of the whole thing. He thought it was something different than every other person thought. He thought that he possessed some shadow magic. Like he. He thought Salix had a dark inner demon, which was not a different person, but was him. So when he used the shadow magic and his appearance changed, he thought Salix had a corrupted soul. He thought Salix was just a bad person. <laughs> Very specifically, all of the details pointed to somebody else doing what Salix did. Because uh -huh. he always talked about a switch being flipped and Salix doing something very different. To him, it was Salix snapped maybe has some PTSD and starts doing heinous things. But to me, it was, that's not Salix. Somebody else <laughs> takes over. And when I start dropping these details of his appearance changing, Daniel's like, oh, shadow magic. And everyone else is like, you're uh, possessed. Yeah, <laughs> Someone that, else is in not, there. Yeah. <laughs> so fully, it was just a surprise that he played into it. And then when you guys would ask him questions about it, he answered questions that worked for both perspectives. Because he was like, no, that's not... That's a part of me, but that's not who I am. And it's like, you're correct. You're fully right in a way that you don't know. <laughs> that definitely isn't you. <laughs> and there was this like weird ambiguity with the like the Vesperin thing. Cause it was like, oh, that's kind of really bad that you that you did that because of Kellen. And I couldn't tell anybody like it had nothing to do with Salix. That was fully somebody else. <laughs> it was just such a good reveal. Cause it all played on me basically saying that one image you sent me. 150 days ago i saved it just for this twist <laughs> so so back so going back to my question daniel how did salix feel about learning about this shadow uh, brother distraught <laughs> he was he was kind of fucked up for a minute uh, especially um i think it was yeah it came to a uh like a like that head right after um or like right when he was being shown his whole past and everything and his brother was like that's me like you know pointing to his grave and i'm like oh, this is a lot of that that's why like usually i would have liked to say that like uh a battle nearby would have brought him out of any kind of stupor he was in like when you guys were all fighting the hag and like Salix was still up there just kind of staring <laughs> into the distance. Like, yeah, he was real messed up about it. That was, that was a, that was actually really good sort of exposition on, uh, I believe a backstory you didn't even know existed. Mm -mm. So yep. Salix, uh, his backstory was intentionally left open for Ian to do what he wanted with. Which I regret to greatly now. fuck you over? Yeah. No. That's so good. Because <laughs> he was only supposed to be like a temporary character at the beginning. You, yeah. I mean, you, you, gave a, you gave a DM their wet dream for God's sakes. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, here's here's a lot to go work with. Here's I'll an entirely blank slate. I just got a <laughs> random personality. Go enjoy. 175 and I'm a war veteran. I'm like, I'll do, okay. <laughs> yes. That is a sandbox. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, fully just didn't. I'm, I'm glad he ran with it because, yeah, he had no idea. And there's some things that I want people to know ahead of time just because it's their character. But some things are just so 
so great to deliver as a surprise because then you think about your character and you're like, yeah, of course that happened. Like the director had no idea he was in debt at all. So I told Mitchell, your character is, um, is, is after the director over 20,000 gold worth of debt, <laughs> like level two. <laughs> I mean, and Alex, the player sense. was just like, yeah, that tracks. This is a complete yeah. surprise, but yeah, of course, <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> Why wouldn't he be? So, so I, I also, I, I don't think it was the last game. I think it was the game before. But I, I visibly saw your face in just sort of your brain just hit a glitch. And and you I, I really think it took you a moment to figure out what Vesperin had done and try and track what the sequence of the next set of events would be. Yeah. Uh so I, I guess the only way I could compare it is I had my Morpheus moment. And I was like, you could take the red pill or the blue. And then she just took both. And I was like, Whoa, what? Like <laughs> how, what am I supposed to do with that? Uh, I planned two options, obviously. Yeah. Um, and you just completely flipped the table. Uh, yeah, no, I, I broke a little bit, but uh, yeah, yeah. I managed to improvise. You did. I, I mean, honestly, when all was said and done, I think you pulled it out like supremely. It was, it was <sighs> great, but as a player, it is one of those beautiful moments to just watch the DM brain go, eh, what? Like, and just glitch out, uh, just straight up yeah. glitch out. <laughs> so good. Like, you can't do that. But I mean, you could do anything, but you can't do that. <laughs> I didn't yeah, plan for this part. <laughs> I, yeah, and me describing Rune was actually just me describing me. <laughs> I was like, he is, <laughs> he's watching everything, but can't interact. Um, he, he controls all of the pieces on the board as he battles his, his inner self and he has no idea what's going on. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, the last None part's whatsoever. just me, but, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> you guys are doing great. I'll figure this out. It can be a week. It'll make sense. I feel like there's a lot of parallels between Rune and Salix right now. And I tried to contrast them a lot because if, if I portrayed it differently, they would seem almost too alike. And I, I didn't want to make it seem like there was a connection there because they are different. Like the Salix and Zestrix thing is extremely different from the Rune and Menoth thing. But outside of this dream, they kind of manifested very similarly. Where it was sort of like, there's two people in here uh, and one kind of does the bad stuff and the other does the good stuff. But uh, Salix also yeah, does no. a lot of bad stuff. I want to put it out there. He's done yeah. really bad stuff that he's uh, justified badly. <laughs> I did it for love. I did it because I liked killing people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been um, I've been trying to. So, so of course, I'm 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 hoping to see to play Rune again. Um, uh, I would definitely like to to see where that story goes if. If the powers that be, Ian, <laughs> allow it to happen. Um, but with that though, like there's there's this entire. This is my poker face for while people yeah, speculate right. about my game. <laughs> there, there's this entire, uh, like a series of events that I've been trying to figure out, like what, when, if, Rune returns, like, how is he going to? justify all of this because by all accounts as we discovered like there there's been a sequence of events that he's been playing out in his head unbeknownst to everybody in order to get to this point so when did that start when did he make that connection and yep. then when is he, how is he going to be able to look at his, his friends again and confess that he had to keep them in this, in dark, in the dark, because to tell them would have been to show the hand that he had. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been, I can't tell you how many scenes have played out in my head with the rest of the party that's still there 
on how that's going to go. And most of them typically end with either Vesperin stabbing him in the face or Salix punching him a lot. The, the thing about, uh, yeah, so you sort of had that Doctor Strange moment. The just doesn't mean this is the goal. I knew what it was going to cost, like sacrifice the queen, whatever, like chess thing. Um, the only thing is the Kellen, the Kellen problem um, is going to be the hardest. No. Kellen definitely died. You saw him and were like, uh, theoretically, if it were the top priority, he could have been saved. He could have been brought back, probably. But like the the timing of everything was sort um, of like you might not be able so to. So I'll, I'll I'll fill you in on where Salix is at. Uh, heads with flies. <laughs> um, so because he killed him. Yeah, Salix uh, sacrificed Kellen's last heartbeat. Um, the time that he could have spent with him for like technically eternity. Uh, because he couldn't let the, the, the anger he had cool, because if he didn't have that to push him forward, he wouldn't be able to do what was necessary to save everybody that was outside of the dream. So he sacrificed that like instantly. He was like, I know this is, we could be, this is only like a breath in here or whatever, but I need this rage. Can't use this. Uh, gotta go i got a crazy wizard that needs me and then he sees zestrix beat his brother like beat kellen to death with a hammer and he's like i'm just gonna kill myself now like i can't fucking win yep (laughs) that was by the way that scene that entire scene that that little monologue there like some of the best role-playing that i've seen that was so good I, I, I was getting misty. I'm still heartbroken. I, I think, that, I think there, there had been a, yeah, there had been some loose water on the face for, from that. That was a, yeah, that was super intense. That was the most time I've ever had. Like, like a period of, I was like maybe up to a hundred years worth of time in there. And I planned it. I was like, I know j- roughly what's going to happen. And I, what I didn't expect was a complete rejection of it. And it, had me shocked just absolutely shocked yeah that was, that was really crazy good. uh and then the, really there's, this, there's this there's really this like yeah you killed it i mean I, my, my jaw dropped I, I felt like i was like a player like like <laughs> wow this is this was not expecting i had no control over this it's not like writing where you know like i was just like Wow, what? I am what not. I'm experiencing this with you guys right now. Yeah, and um, there's this like weird symbolism where uh, you don't know for a fact if you did, because in a way you're split. Zestrix killed Kellen, but you killed Kellen. But there's like a, in a way, you're the same person. You grew up together, you kind of occupied the same vessel. So you don't know if you dropping that was almost even just against your will as it facilitated what was actually happening, which was Zestrix killing him. But, but in a way it's also you. So it's like, you don't even know really what caused what, but um, they're fully tied together and it's extremely heartbreaking. It is. It is. I think, I think there's something that, that goes to the fact that regardless of, regardless of the cause of Kellen's death, there's still that that choice that Salix made to go, no, I I hate you right now. And I need that hate to protect the people who've been there for me. Yeah. Oh. Like that. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's I, I thought that was really good. I really did think that was good. Yeah. yeah no, and like- and can we can we can we recognize the absolute beauty that was alex that night like that shit was episode 31 fire with the with the makeup yeah oh yes yeah no i I, like uh, oh yeah that had been notch that had been weeks in the making it was it was like halfway through (laughs) september when we started planning that for the halloween i go over and i uh, i'm talking to alex and alex is like 
oh yeah, I had a, I'm bringing in a new character. And I'm like, oh, tell me more about them. I'm trying to pump my friend <laughs> I've known forever <laughs> for information. And he stonewalls me. He's like, you'll have to wait and find out. Oh, dropping it. Yeah. All right. Dan was mad. I'll see what's up. So I message him. I'm like, uh, you've turned everybody against me. <laughs> But like you tell you, you are always sharing future future plans for your character. Every player individually has plans for things later on that other people don't know about. Yeah, like I that's know. most. Oh, of I have my so downside. many plans for Rune, but uh, so I definitely would. I I totally saw this like sitcom western with the the stranger, Lady Death, and Grim, just sort of sauntering <sighs> off into the sunset as a western going to solve some problems so I... that's funny because i thought about that just today about like uh like taking what's really dark which is a bunch of like phrasma worshipers and making it funny and lighthearted to do like a like a to catch a necromancer or something <laughs> like you go to there's like a ritual and they show up and they're like all right i brought the ritual candles and then like there's like nothing there and they're like uh, I'm going to leave. And then there's a bunch of guards like, no, you got to take a seat. And you just come up as the gunslinger, like, have a seat. <laughs> Why don't you sit down there? Yeah. Take a seat. You're here, to, you're here to summon the dead, right? And he's like, no, no. You're like, well, that's not what it says on the scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> I got this pamphlet right here that says otherwise. And there are about 50 more signs outside. You dumb shits decide to post up. I love it. I, I have love, no idea why that came to mind, but it, it stuck with me. I love the um the relationship that the pale stranger um and the other other two had with each other. Yeah. Like um Lady Death and Grim. Lady, Lady Death and <laughs> <laughs> Sam's character Grim. was the best because she just kept chiding at the, the pale strangers like well, you could hit it eventually. <laughs> like I'm so no neutral. Good. Really embracing Phrasma as the neutral god that doesn't care who's going to die in this situation. It's like I, that's fine. Well, so what, what was really funny is uh, um, Sam had had pinged me, and and she was like, oh, "Are you undead?" And I was like, "Well, kinda." Just a little bit. And she's like, do I need to kill you? I'm like, oh, no, no. We're we're all three on the same side. <laughs> hold on now. Hold on. <laughs> we're all after the same thing. Don't worry. I'm your undercover dead. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. I, especially for three characters that had no playtime prior. That was a good bet. Like, there was good connections there. It was definitely oh, yeah. Well, connection. like, the mo as soon as I saw... Uh, Alex's character and what they represent in terms of the champion. I'm like, you're Lady Death, plain and simple. So and then cool. when uh, when Sam came, I'm like, oh, okay, that's clearly a, a, a Reaper type, but yep. Reaper's not a good one. That's not going to roll off really well. So I was like, I'm going to call you Graham. <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, and I don't know if anybody caught the significance of that so the scythe had an hourglass inside and the idea is that when you meet people they're the last somebody like grim would be the last person that a soul would meet before being killed to be their soul to be taken to mm -hmm. the afterlife being an outer plane like heaven or hell or what are the other four um or just reincarnation um and what sam would do would be to just hold up the scythe and it starts counting on the hourglass now if they had a good story if, if their last words were anything worthwhile she could just turn it 90 degrees and let it sit and it's a pause and if they had something else they wanted to say you just tip it down and suddenly you're getting your time back but as <laughs> soon as it sounds like you're just trying to buy time the scythe comes up like what would somebody say like how would somebody react if they had 20 seconds left like, they go watch their get. time running out. You've got 20 seconds of saying anything you want to say. And then all those memories are gone. Cause it's, I mean, it is a clean reboot. Like there's nothing 
mm. after that I, that reincarnation. I feel like if Rune was in that situation, that he would end up playing a board game with with Grim. Be like, well, you know, uh, we could sit down and play, like, talk this over, and then the scythe would be sat down. Your time would start trickling back in, and then you guys start putting the pieces up. And that's I'm feeling how very attacked right now. I'm, I'm feeling very attacked right now. <laughs> Fully that. So, how do you feel? Like, how do you feel uh, about your uh, character arc? Me? Mm-hmm. Oh, for Rune? I mm-hmm. um actually it's I like it. So let me let me just start with the short answer. I like it. Like the the way the character has changed from my original I even can't even really call it vision, but the original character um personality that I had has definitely shifted because of the terrible choices he's made to get to the answer that he desperately fought to to find um and now he is he has achieved that original goal but his path to achieve it has hurt so many of the people that he cares about after all this time yeah like trying to there is there is going to be I, i'm fairly certain there's going to be another change if when if he comes back yeah like they're, they're, he can't be the same and it's so strange because the because of the time dilation of, of role playing and how you know lots of time passes in such a short period of real time like this yep. this prisoner rune has been around for for a bit for a bit of time um but role playing wise it's you know, it hasn't been too long but i, I think there's I think there's another shift in his character that's that's coming along. Yep. Um, but yeah, the the ride so far. I mean, he's he achieved his theory um, about four levels early because there's this in so in, in little rules talk here in Pathfinder Two E there is a a skill feat called Unifying Theory, and it. It's under Arcana, and the idea is that you have a, you have achieved a level of understanding of magic uh, to be able to use your Arcana skill for nature, religion, and occult. So you, you've identified the connective tissue, basically, between those four areas of magic. Um, Rune effectively learned, learned it a little early because he's able to cast all four traditions of magic he can right. he can cast divine and uh, occult and all that jazz so um but the skill feed is at 15 so yeah he just got there a little mm. he, he figured out the secret a little early um but he hasn't yeah. quite mastered gotta... the connection yet man and there are still so many um strange mysteries and plot threads that have yet to be answered like uh, the connection between Rune and Lamb and Breachton, the founder of Breach Hill, from bloody 100, mystery. 150 years ago, no idea. Guy vanished, and you showed up looking just like the statue. Uh, so, um, I know you guys, you know, runs well. Dan, you ran. Hopefully, you'll you'll run again. Um, but aside from the games that you run, what do you like to? play like what is what is your go-to game that you can just you jump into and it it works every time like a video game uh in general dan's gonna say you're gonna say civ 5 aren't you (laughs) (laughs) i got got it i love conquering the world uh oh it's coming Uh, it's coming with salix so um with with video games, I I love any kind of strategy games. Honestly, uh, I can I like I I will clock some. I've I've clocked like five hundred hours into Civ, like easily. Um, one more turn, just one more turn. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 my life. Yeah. Like, yeah. really, really bad. And uh, but when when it comes to tabletops, um. I am actually more familiar with World of Darkness as a tabletop game. 
uh, than I am with Pathfinder. Like, this is actually my first Pathfinder, like, full on Pathfinder game. Um, I sat in and, like, kind of played, like, an NPC here and there before. And majority of the other games, I like, I played D&D, like, one shots and two shots here and there. But other than that, um, yeah. I, I can throw down World some Mortal Darkness. Darkness. Uh, but I do love Pathfinder old world because I or love new fantasy. World. Um, old world or new world? Mm, I think it's new world. It's uh, changeling. Requiem and yeah. changeling the, the lost. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Ian, what experience you got? Um, Every single Elder Scrolls game ever. <laughs> Skyrim's at like at least 1,200 hours. Morrowind at 800. Oblivion at 1,000. I, pl- I mean, I played Daggerfall and Arena and yeah. the card game. I played Legends. I played like the MMO. Dear, you're I, an Elder Scrolls guy. I played Blades for like 100 hours, the mobile game, just because I was like, I guess you're, if you're making it, I've, I've got to play it now. Uh, uh, yeah, I get, I start playing some intellectual property and I get big on the lore and I just will not put it down. Like I can't browse um, the fantasy worlds because I love the feeling of being familiar with certain things. So like starting a new thing, like I try to get into dragon age and it's like, I can't put myself through this again. Like I can't do the like two in the morning scrolling through the, like the lore wiki. Cause that's what I do is I get all the way into it. Like with pathfinder, I D and D I'm sure D and D is fantastic for what it is. I can't start using it because I'm obsessed with pathfinder. I that. just can't start learning that other thing is I just want to like, I want to know as much as possible Dude. about it at any cost. <laughs> and it's been so, at so great you're, cost. You're a, you're a Pathfinder guy. Like that is your I just lo- tabletop yeah. bread and butter. I've just, yeah, for some reason, the system has mm-hmm. been an absolute sandbox of just, they, they oh, said like, legit. let's take, let's take every type of fantasy we know and make a parallel on this planet and so that way you can you want to know anything. the real bad thing is his obsession rubs off on you like it really he, does he sends me me wiki wiki links <laughs> and uh <laughs> next thing you know i'm up at like i have to be up at 4 a.m and then I'm, I'm i'm up reading wiki links about uh freaking the elven capital of this world and i'm like well i want to go there uh <laughs> yep like oh yeah the through- the gods and the, the elf gate the elf gate rabbit hole that i dropped down because of him is yep. not healthy <laughs> yeah, no i like i uh, yeah. now know so much about this world um that i'm using it to base like a whole book off of. that's, that's <laughs> my novel yeah. is literally based off of pathfinder lore like i've but, taken but pathfinder it lore is based, based off the of... subject going with it yeah it, well they just make a they make a little bit of everything. So there are a lot of settings, like systems, where it's like, hey, we use this type of magic. And a lot of games that do the same thing because of the restrictions of like a video game. Pathfinder is like, yeah, so we have all the types of magic. You could do the fancy and magic vibe. You could do the like the witch vibe. You could do, you could write, if you wanted to make a campaign that somehow conformed to the idea that magic doesn't exist except in the form of alchemy, it's all there. You just have to remove some stuff. But they have like a version of it everywhere. And you can just, if you search long enough on that wiki, you will find something that's you what you're it. trying yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I feel like I punish the players when I make them make knowledge checks. So I'm like, hey, make a knowledge religion check. All right, uh, read this page. <laughs> that's what your player knows. Just everything on that page. <laughs> It'll only take like 20 minutes. Good luck. <laughs> so uh, back in the day, I played some old world, uh, some early LARP old world, which is actually where um, uh, the original Mr. Smith had come from. Oh. Um, origin yeah. story? Yeah, it's a bit of an origin story. So um, there was this uh, hundred or so person LARP, troop LARP game. Oh. So wasn't a part of any big so gaming many. organization it was just about 100 local people in a southern state all getting together pretending to be vampires and 
werewolves specifically. And um, in this particular LARP world, there, uh, well, in the old world of darkness in general, there was in the, the werewolf side of things, there was this company called Pentex, which was the, you know, eco destroyer, you know, polluting the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had grabbed one of the subsidiaries and uh, at the head of this particular subsidiary was a individual simply known as Mr. Smith. And uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> Mr. Smith was, so, so there was a creature known as a Nexus crawler. Anyone who's ever read the old world of darkness, a Nexus crawler was uh, a creature of um, the, oh, there was the triad. There was the worm, the weaver, it's a creature of the worm, pure chaos. Um, and it came from a realm of ju just chaos. <clears throat> so the story was, is that there was a Nexus crawler so old that it had found a way to worm its way into the real world and had retained enough intelligence to take a form and had worked with Pentex in order to sow the seeds of chaos uh, and empower the worm to take over the world, to chew the world up. And this particular Nexus crawler took on the moniker, Mr. Smith. And for about three to four years, the player, he was, Mr. Smith was the, the shadowy, evil destroyer of characters' lives. Um, there were countless battles that involved him and uh, he was their final battle on the last session of that. Life. No, are you serious? Yeah. Serious. Oh, that's great. There you Wow. So of course that would become memorable to, oh, wow. So that is the birth of Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith has transcended uh, the legend to pocket themselves, not only here in front of you, uh, but also in the world known as Obsidian, which was an independent game about a decade ago, actually a decade and a half ago, I guess. Uh, set in a post-apocalyptic world where the sins of man had uh, opened up the gates to hell. The seven circles had opened up and uh, demons had come forth into the world. And, and the eighth circle, the Christ demon, as it was called, had come down to help humanity survive. And in this blasted wasteland of terra firma, there was a single obelisk known as the zone. It was this gigantic cube where the last vestige of humanity survived. And uh, it is one of the only games I've ever played where you can actually create a, uh, a company and be a, a, like a member of that company and gain ranks. It was a very interesting game. I highly recommend yeah. it if you can find the books. And then uh, he, was a, he was a shadow runner. Smith uh, poured himself over into Shadowrun and was a face man because, you know, he's a con man. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. The wow. Smith you see before you has seen many worlds. Yeah. So, Sounds like Salix before he yeah. got swept up in, uh, uh, in Pathfinder. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're, Salix is a, uh, Salix a world traveler. Originally a, um, Salix was originally a vampire character. He was a... Oh, nice. Um, he was an Asimite, uh, warrior, and he had the merit of the one where you can just summon your sword using, vi uh, your blood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, I remember one night, like, I think it was like my third or fourth game. I walked into Elysium and they, they removed all my weapons. Uh, but then he summoned a sword and, uh, promptly try to murder somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Which, and for uh, those who don't know that's what you do not do on Elysium yeah no but uh, I totally did and nobody knew. of course you did yeah yeah. Jeez. but the thing was like I had made such fast friends with a few people there um, they had like they saw it and they're like 
what's going on over here? And they walked over, and I'm like, oh, by the way, this guy just insulted, uh, I forget what, like, the name, like, what I, pretty much conned them into helping me kill them, this person. And, uh, real quick, fast friends, after that, uh, never went to Elysium again. <laughs> I'll bet. Was that, was that a face. tabletop or a LARP? That was a LARP. We, oh yeah. We had uh we had two locations. We had um Elysium and then we had uh like a uh anarchy meetup or anarch meetup uh place. Mm -hmm. Can't really remember the name of it right now, but uh We'll have to we'll have to induct you at some point, Ian. Yeah. Yeah, I've never done the LARP thing. Not once. You should you should totally do the LARP thing. Jeez, I, who knows? You're you're a venture through and through. Oh, what? definitely. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I thought it was a adventure. Gryffindor. More <laughs> I thought it was a Gryffindor. <laughs> um, could you be the Could you be the Sorting Hat? For <laughs> we just sorted you. I mean, okay. congratulations. Right. Do you, Do you, Do you want me to sit on your face? Because just <laughs> oh <my> <laughs> you walked into that one. Thanks. Just here's the door. So what? So what did I just get assigned? Uh, you're a vampire. Ooh, I'm in a. Oh, you vampire noob, you. What? So what's the? What am I in the clan of like people who have like facts about like a uh, shit so or something? So true. Are they're pretty? Um. Help me out here, Owen. I mean, they're blue bloods. <laughs> they're they're the they're the the royalty of. Vampire bloodlines mm. of sorts, yeah, mm. yeah. They the the Ventru typically uh, become uh, businessmen. You know, your terrible, your your sleazy lawyers, the CEO, your shadowy GMs, yeah. GMs, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> GMs. Wow, you do a LARP I... game, but in the LARP game, people in the LARP play D and D. <laughs> And there's there's uh, so I've, I've been to I've been to a convention where that has in fact happened. Uh, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a LARP convention, um, which was really weird because it was a it was a vampire LARP that occurred in New Orleans, which in and of itself was that sounds amazing. Oh, oh you that went sounds to the, good. You went to the big one, the big the, the oh yeah. Really, oh, I'm so jealous. So the jealous. first one, the very first one that uh, that White Wolf hosted. Oh. Well, it was CCP at the time, but yeah. yeah. So jealous. Yeah, it was a... So, um, but yes, there was, a, there was a group of people who, because there were so many people there and not nearly enough storytellers and storytelling staff, they just started playing Dungeons & Dragons in character as a, as a way to pass the time. Another so little side note on, on that particular convention... So CCP, which if you if you if you know who they are, they they own the Eve online game, and so they are made of money um, for all intents and purposes, and gave the the CCP rep a blank check for this bloody convention, and so they rented out a warehouse factory place or what have you, turned it into the Succubus Club bar. And it was just a all night party. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's stuff you like when you hear stories about things that just go off perfectly. You always have to wonder, like, how did that not get fire festival? You know, how did it go so well? Because, like, if you have any experience in logistics or event planning, like, I can't get like two of my brothers to show up <laughs> to like eat dinner with me because there's like something's going to happen. How do people make like giant conventions that have never happened before? Like just happen. It, it's uh, unbelievable to me. It, it's uh, yeah, but Fire money. Festival, like some things like people throw money and the more money they put at it, the more it falls to crap. Because like people are like, can I get a hand in that pot? And like things oh, just I mean, get that's like fair. But, out of control. Well, so I mean, um, so the, the, the organization that was the primary host of that convention had been doing this for two decades, I think, already. Oh, okay, there At least is. a decade That's and a half, the, right? Yep. So so there was a lot of experience in 
all the necessary logistics and and a lot of that groundwork is laid easily a year or more beforehand particularly for something so large right oh, okay, and once right. you threw once you had a chance to throw in ccp money because they wanted they, they were the they were the big sponsors right like it was their right. product getting out there um they just threw a ton of money at it and uh and Ugh. to be honest, I mean, nothing goes smooth. Nothing's ever perfect. There were there were right. shit that happened that weekend. Let me tell you, arriving at <laughs> arriving at Bourbon Street at two a.m., learning Ooh. that that place never closes is a dangerous proposition. I assure you, <laughs> when you and four yeah. of your mates are walking down Bourbon Street, so <laughs> the girls on Bourbon Street are not allowed to leave the buildings. So they hang outside the door <laughs> and when you're, you and four of your mates are walking down, all of a sudden you look behind you and one of you is missing as you see him get pulled into a club <laughs> by these harpies. <laughs> these harpies. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, well, we'll either see him in a few hours. We're going to get a call from him in Mexico that he's lost a liver. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. I mean, you've got so many organs. Just oh, yeah, just you yeah. know, you it's can like take you a can penny, leave one. a penny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Take You're a fine. penny. Leave. Wow. Yeah. You so took crazy. my liver, you left me with a pancreas. I yeah. sure. <laughs> Whatever. If you needed it, okay. I'll take it. You make <laughs> trades? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. There, it's yeah, just such some a, crazy old gamer stories. Such a big world ttrpgs and i've got just this little this is it oh yeah i've got this yeah. little bit penny I'm not is looking uh, in the kaleidoscope i'm, I'm on that just that little thing but i do it well penny but i just do that little really thing desperate for convention season to come back i, I want to set up a little yeah. uh news booth at a convention convention that'd be really nice so fun that's another thing I never Gen did. Gen Con, Dragon Con. I've never been to a single convention of any type. Of I'm a, so I've sorry. never any. I mean, I used to go to like, like conventions for like buying catering stuff when I did catering. <laughs> so it's not like fun. It's people are like, hey, uh, you want this espresso machine? Like, absolutely not. That's not even <laughs> remotely in the budget. But I mean, I'll drink some of this. So, <laughs> okay, I'll, bye. I'll happily taste your espresso. That's it. Yeah, no, no comic book characters, nothing. Yeah, we'll need to, we'll need to fix that, my friend. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, when, you know. Yeah, when, when we're all not gestures broadly, done. when that's done. Yeah, whenever. <laughs> chaos. Yes. When, when we return to. Clearly, my plans went awry. Yeah, it was a weird time to get into tabletops. Also, the best time too, right? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Like just, just some of the time, like the times I spend, like leading up to stream, like you know when we're just kind of hanging out, like that's like I take that as like if we were actually hanging out, like oh yeah, and that's like I've I've come to enjoy that time because I don't I very rarely see people outside of work. And um, I can't have that in my life because work is very uh, stressful. <laughs> um, so when I'm able to like before and then after the the times when we're like we're coming down from the the post role play kind of kind of adrenaline rush and all that other stuff because our wonderful GM Ian here always leaves us with a cliffhanger. Um, oh. I I just think. So I, I look forward to that. So every Sunday from like, you can, you can ask him from like six to like six 30. I'm like, are you ready to get on yet? Because I, I need, I need to do stuff. Like I need to talk and I need to converse and I need to like, let's do this now. <laughs> yep. so, yeah. I, I feel, I feel you can, you, you both might be on the same vein. The friends I have met through gaming are some of the best friends I have ever had 100%. hands down like i still have gaming friends i'm actually i'm, I'm going to be disappearing here in in what about a week and a half 
uh, spending a weekend oh, yeah. or a week yeah. playing D and D with when Rune Volker. dies. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I see what you did there. I see I what you to, did I there. Got, I just got to throw them all. I will find you. I, I, Mr. Smith will find. I have a very particular set of skills, and they all involve dice. I will LARP you to death. <laughs> <laughs> I will yeet those dice down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. Eat point those this, things. Bitch. <laughs> I think, I think, what happens there is that there is a filtering process and like a vetting process when it comes to getting a good party together. Mm. So you'll have like a bunch of people come and go, and then you'll get the people that come and stick. And there is no greater compatibility between people as friends than. Being able to play very different characters on both sides and still being able to role play together. Because what it does is it's like, what's the common denominator between all of your PCs and all of his PCs? You two as people. Because your characters have nothing in common. So obviously you click and there's you have an understanding. It's mm-hmm. like, the it, yeah. My, uh, and I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Dan. My favorite thing um, when it comes down to um, like when you when you find friends, like through role play, like the ultimate test is when your characters argue, like, and you, like, it always happens, at least in one, every game. If your games, like, if your characters aren't arguing, then you're not running a good game. But when, you're, when your players go at it, and at the end of the day, they're either upset or they stop, they break up, break off, and they're like, all right, that was good. That was that was a good time. Thank you for that tragedy you have brought into my life. I will take that and run with it. Um, by the way, uh, Rune, you're an asshole. Um, I hate to have to kill you. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Yeah, like people are like yelling at each other and getting close, and there's like that rage. And then I'm like, and cut. And they're like, all right, that was great. That that was a wrap. Uh, next uh, next week, we're we're good. <laughs> like, wow, okay. Uh. I have, it even I have me. thoroughly enjoyed the conflict <laughs> that Rune has instigated and and just continue to sort of push. And uh, I, I think I think and, and you can answer this, Dan, having having experience that I'm I hope maybe. I think it Rune's um honest, like considerate nature is frustrating. Because Rune will do this just dumb shit. But then so, look at you and go, listen, I'm so sorry. It had to be done. I did it for you. That's, uh, yeah, you that's what, this was necessary to oh, ensure our survival. I know this hurt. It's, it is a little frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah. Because like I, as being like on, I love it as a, as a player. Um, Salix hates it. Uh, he's like <laughs> he has a great heart he does and it's gonna look great in my hand when i'm watching him die like that's that's sailing right there <laughs> but me i'm like yep it's like mr smith you set him up and you knock him down every time and you have <laughs> yep. your your character has great intentions but... he died. <laughs> it's fully true I mean, that character yep i will i will confidently say this rune absolutely loves each and every one of his companions like he will he will straight up die for all of you now are you going to die up until the point to ensure so that he can ensure he gets what he wants that may also be true but he will go to the ends of the earth to try and bring you back (laughs) yeah it's looking like that um and we are in hell right now so yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, and the ugh, this GM, whoever he is, decided like if we're getting to the point where Rune has to bring back his fallen companions, what if I just put uh I don't know like three scions of Phrasma right there to, just to watch him do it? <laughs> you know, uh, excuse let's just, me. Let's just uh, be here. I just need to make sure I'm clear about this. All three of you represent the goddess of death. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just gonna bring this one back to life. Just hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, boy. Stare. I will shove this cannon down your throat. 
and Honestly, put my I have... foot up your ass. Grim turns the side, the, the clock slowly <laughs> yeah. forward. He's got a couple <laughs> seconds, and I think that, that's such a tragedy that Rune won't meet the gunslinger, uh, not, know, not right? in the full capacity. But honestly, it's not because they would not get along. Oh no, not even. Nah, he kind of. He he blows that off. <laughs> yeah, not even kind of. I do. I do have to say, I uh, I had the the pleasure of joining Ian's first game, which uh, introed a few of the characters you've seen in this one, and uh, oh yeah, it really has been a pleasure to play in his games. They are fantastic. They're, uh, it's a rolling continuity of we utter were, uh, chaos. We were actually talking about this earlier um, because I have a problem where I can't stay in the present and just enjoy what's in front of me. I have to look to the future. <laughs> so I was like, so your next game, um, I'm playing in that one, right? <laughs> and the answer, yeah, there are people. You're, you're people you're, asking me when my next campaign starts. I'm like, okay, so this campaign goes on until late 2021, maybe early 2022, and you're in it. You're not waiting for anything. You're still in my game every week. What? That'd be like watching, like you're watching Infinity War. Like, when is Endgame, right? Like, just watch it. <laughs> you're in it. You're in it right now. But I'm so I, I mean, excited. <laughs> no, I, to- I, totally, I totally feel Dan that like, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I am, I am enjoying Rune. I, I enjoyed playing the Gunslinger, of course. Always fun. I enjoy these events that are happening. But you, Ian, you create such an engaging story and world. Like, I, it makes me think up other ideas. Like I, like I said, I have two other ideas that I put together over the last two weeks. I want to see it. Just completely different non-wizard ideas oh i dry aged people's character ideas so i gotta get them early yeah i, yeah. I, I put them in they go in the disney vault and i just have to uh, that's I fair just gotta mull over them as i Re- recycle them every now and again yeah because it's more fun killing off a character when you inject their backup character into it because <laughs> that way they know nobody else knows they know that player coming. knows they're dead they're like if you sent me my backup character you sent me it yeah, I'm dead. I'm dead, dead. <laughs> That's not a terrible move, by the way. That is that is a solid idea. That's yeah, like a good the, lead in. The gunslinger, I was like, yeah, you're not playing Rune today. <laughs> Next week, <laughs> Rune's gone. You know you're playing the gunslinger because that was your old character. So- Although I think uh, I, I, I couldn't, honestly, I could not remember the personality of the original uh, stranger. So yeah, this one was completely off, completely new. Yeah, he was a blank slate. That's why I asked you. I asked you before the session, like, remember when I was like, I was probing you about your Russian accent? <laughs> I was like, how's your Russian, by the way? Like, could you just nail a Russian accent for like three know, hours? Not even, just no. all the time you're ahead? Yeah. I've, I've been, I've been, uh, flying. To, no, I can't do it. Flying. I'm still not good at the Russian. The Russian. Russian? Russian. Yeah, I can't. I, I don't like. Hello, comrade. Please pour vodka. Hello, comrade. Comrade. Comrade? Comrade? Hello, comrade. We need to get... I usually have to start with, like, a dosvidanya. Yeah, yeah, you have to, like... yeah. I can see, like... Tr- start with a full stereotype. And the braces. Oh, oh, no. No, I can't yeah. imagine. Oh. Vodka. Vodka. Sounds, like a, sounds right. just like a Russian person with braces. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Man. I really, really would love to nail a, a, a Russian accent. I just can't. I love Daniel. I love if you Russian could, accents. if you could instantly get a perfectly fluent accent, what would it be? Australian. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. That's intense. Oh, like to be Australian, eh? <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. Shit, I got nothing. The mosses down there, they don't. Uh, I mean, they're they're all right. Not too bad, really. Wow. The bob. Why are you yeah. doing this to oh, me? Back there in the bush. What was that? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Love you, mate. I pick one that is extremely niche and hard to hard to say. So that way people would think I'm fully from there. 
to just the uh, really throw them off. The one of all oh god, South African. Yeah, South, I was gonna South say Africa. That. South Africa. Yep. Yeah. It, uh, I've always wanted to try and get the the South African accent, but it's it's this weird mix between uh like Australian and uh, 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 UK. It's very short sort of yeah. terms. It's a weird blend. It really is. Yeah. yeah. It's hybrid but, uh, and there was a, super subtle. <laughs> there was a, the, a, a guy I'd LARPed with pulled off a South African accent superbly. I was so jealous. I think, I think a lot about what makes like uh, things like South African accent is the if you can pick up like colloquialisms and and sayings from that it help it really like sells the accent uh for something like that so they don't know enough about yeah south african terms yeah that makes sense mm-hmm. i love a, a good hybrid accent i remember meeting somebody in virginia that had a half russian and half southern accent and it was just something else i was like you are you're a, you're one of those weird mixed drinks, but as a person, like this is unique <laughs> and it's got a lot of flavor. That that is that is some pro work right there. I Doesn't am it not. Sa- I don't know. Yeah, it's. I was baffled. Like, yeah. Wow. Shoo. Don't get it. No, I couldn't do that. Uh. Uh-uh. I mean, in fairness, my my accents are probably meh, average, I guess. I once, I went to work, I used to work at a call center, right? And for, yeah. I worked there for about a year and a half. For a full year, I sat next to a guy in a cubicle who spoke in a Australia, a thick Australian accent. And everybody thought he was from Australia. One day he comes in and he speaks perfectly fine. No accent, nothing. And I'm like, What's going on? Like, are you just imitating us? He's like, no, I'm, I'm from from Brooklyn. <laughs> what? He's like, Jeez. yeah, no. I, he's like, I to to pass the time and entertain myself. I would when I talk on the phone to people, I just use an Australian accent, and it's funny. I'm like, what? He's uh, like, yeah. Props to that dude. <laughs> I was like, all right. Yeah, props to that dude. How? Like, like how? How do you, because I can't, there, I just get stuck on certain mouth sounds and then I feel like I hit a wall and then I just can't do it. So I usually just impersonate other celebrities that have the same accent as me and talk a little bit different. So like when I do a character, I don't want to do just me, but I don't want to do the British accent and then I get stuck on a word like, how do I pronounce it? Okay, I guess I'm skipping that word entirely so that way I don't like completely collapse on it. So I'll just pick a celebrity who does a voice that sounds different, but is just still the kind of the same accent as me. So like for an NPC, I'll be, I'll be like, okay, I guess we'll just do weird George Clooney <laughs> or old Nathan Fillion. Like you just like take a thing and mix it up a little bit and just sort of run with it. Cause if you're wrong, you just sound weird, but you're not mixing up. They're not like, that's not how you pronounce that. Cause it's like, I'm just talking funny. It has nothing to do. It's the same accent. Just me being weird. I think that's what's great about like fantasy settings too is like you can come up with any accent ever. Like you can hodgepodge anything together. And then if anybody's like, that's not actually how you pronounce that. I'm like, really? Tell me, how do you speak Elvin? I'll wait. Yeah, that, that is true. That I mean, you'll, is you'll, true. Have, you'll have those Tolkien types that'll throw it at you, but no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, no. Those, come those people are a treat. <laughs> I'm not even gonna go. Into it. Yeah, <laughs> you're like your dwarven is wrong. Okay, I, cool. I really wanted my first tattoo uh, to be of an elven, like Tolkien elven, uh, around my arm. And when I went in to get it done, my tattoo artist was super excited for it. He's like, "Yeah, this is gonna be awesome. Let's sit down. Let's knock this out." Um, and he had the stencil and everything pulled up and the client he had before that was walking out saw it and he's like, that's so beneath you. (sighs) Who are you? 
it really it's it's funny the phenomenon where one specific word that somebody picks to say a criticism of you will just stick in your head for the end of time. I remember I said something, I spoke up during like a, like a biology class and the teacher just said that that choice of word is um, robust. And um, <laughs> here I am many years later, not over it. Um, and I can't take a shower without thinking like, why did I, God, I said the stupidest thing and nobody cares um, except me. <laughs> How, how how long ago was that? It was about four years ago. I'm sorry, you yeah. said four years ago? When yes. you were in, in, in second high school? College. Co- oh, Some college. School. Yeah. Get out. Get out of here. I don't want to hear it. You're you're such a baby. Okay. Go off, Dan. Okay. Yeah, so that, that feeling, imagine it thirty years later. I you know, I've you you know, Mr. Like, Smith, I've seen you without that hat on. Um, you don't look as old as you try to nothing, sound. There's nothing right? else but this hat. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's just it's just shadow. It's not. It's your, just. It's your mind. This is my open. face. <laughs> the hat comes off. It's still just black. It's just Darkness. black. It's it void. Pulls the hat, and there's another hat, just like perfectly aligned. I totally like, interrupted you, Dan. Sorry. What were you saying? <laughs> I, I I was just saying, um, yeah. No, there's there's you you're not that old either. Like, oh uh, well, I I appreciate you. <laughs> you're a sexy beast. Oh, don't let anyone That's tell you different. <laughs> He's just out here fishing. Oh. That's it. Stress Man, that chest. I think I got everything that I wanted to talk about. Is it that time? Yeah, I think it's rap time. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for answering. No, 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 no. You two. You two. Oh, thanks. Jeez. The loves of my life. Everybody point to the camera and thank you, viewers. <laughs> you. This wouldn't be possible. Nah, the viewers like are fine. Like that PBS, the PBS <laughs> the viewer, thing. Meh. The, the viewers, viewers are, are fine. fine. What a weird Your niche. Beautiful to be like, faces. You know. <laughs> Let's say you're welcome to the viewers. I appreciate so you, chat. Good. I appreciate all of you. Thanks for coming to hang out, guys. We're going to go to bed now. I'm, yeah, I'm going to yeah. write. Catch yeah. us on Slackers. Sunday, episode 32. Yeah. Um, make sure to uh, brush your teeth and stay fucking hydrated. Yes. Fully that. <laughs> yeah, don't listen to me. Get some sleep. <laughs>